Island. So on behalf of Friends of the Lost Coast and the Bureau of Land Management, King Range National Conservation Area, welcome to the first installment of Conserved Lands and Waters of the Lost Coast, a three-part virtual lecture series. My name is Justin Prelin, Administrative Coordinator with Friends of the Lost Coast. And tonight we will host Bob Wick, a retired BLM staffer and renowned wilderness photographer, and his talk, National Conservation Lands and the King Range. Uh, before we get started though, uh, Friends of the Lost Coast would like to acknowledge that the lands we gather on today are the traditional unceded territory of the Sinkione and Matoll peoples who have stewarded the land, water, plants, and animals from time immemorial with great respect for the interconnectedness of life and ecological knowledge that is foundational to the health and sustainability of the Lost Coast and its preservation for future generations. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. Participants will be muted throughout the presentation until the Q&A. Please use the chat feature to seed Q&A questions or share commentary with the group during the presentation. We'll also be allowing you to turn off your, uh, turn on your cameras and your audio uh, when we get to that portion of the presentation. Also, this lecture is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel, website, and Facebook page in the coming days, so stay tuned for that. And without further ado, please welcome Bob Wick and his talk, National Conservation Lands in the King Rings. Thanks for joining us, Bob. And please tell us a little bit about yourself, your 33 years with BLM, and how life in retirement is treating you thus far. Take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. I appreciate it. It's good to, uh, it's, it would be better to be up at the King Range, but second best to be able to at least talk about it. So I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to uh, to talk with you all. And um, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So let me know. Um, let's see. Oops, slideshow. All right. Am I, uh, are you guys seeing my slide? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, what I would like to do is tell you a little bit about the history of the BLM's National um, Conservation Lands Program and how the King Range fit into both the history of the program as a whole, but also the BLM as an agency. The King Range played a, an early part in the uh, development of the BLM's overall mandate. And um, so touch a little bit on that. I'm going to go back to almost the dinosaurs as, a little bit as far as public land management uh, in the first couple slides, but then we'll get into uh, some more current stuff, uh, both about the King Range, but then I'll take you on a tour of all the various designations uh, that the BLM manages uh, under the family of conservation designations that, that make up the National Conservation Lands. Um, just a little bit of background on myself. I, I actually uh, grew up back in Pennsylvania and went to school uh, in forestry at, at Penn State and Virginia Tech, but there was a job opening with the BLM in Colorado. So I moved there back in 1988 and then uh, moved from there to Ukiah when Ukiah was a district uh, which covered the King Range in Arcata. So I moved there in 1993. So that was the beginning of my involvement with the King Range. Um, they abolished the district in 1995, and I took that opportunity instead of moving uh, somewhere or being put out to pasture in my late 20s, I moved uh, up to the King Range full time. So I worked there full time uh, from 1995 to 2000, and, I, uh, and there were only Three, three of us full-time when I was there. My, I was the first recreation specialist there. Um, we eventually got an interpretive specialist and we had no trail crew, no uh, interpretive um, specialist. And actually the, what, the predecessor group for this organization, the Lost Coast Interpretive Association, we started while I was there. Uh, Ron Broughton, uh, did a great job writing up the articles of incorporation. So kudos to Ron. Um, and a couple of uh, shots here. The This photo is, on the bottom is from Big Flat. Um, and this is a American Hiking Society volunteer vacations uh, group uh, that we had out there. We, I don't know if you guys still work with them or if they even still do those uh, AHS projects, but Nick Raphael was a seasonal at the time. He's on the upper left in this photo. Uh, 
And uh, the guy on the upper right was actually uh, in his 80s. He lied to be able to uh, get into a backpacking program and just pretty much did better than everyone else on the, the trip. Pretty amazing. And then I'm, I'm a young guy on the, the lower right there. But uh, the last um, third of my career, I moved uh, in 2010 to Sacramento and uh, worked uh, for the state office as a wilderness program manager and then remotely worked the last um, six years of my career for the Washington DC office overseeing the wilderness program. But I've always had an interest in photography and the last third of my career with uh, digital photography coming into to being and then especially with social media, um, my name got out there and reputation as a good photographer and I capitalized on that and was able to get out um, up to eight or nine weeks a year uh, photographing lands throughout the West, mostly conservation uh, lands that the BLM manages. So I've been to pretty much every state and every uh, BLM field office uh, in Alaska and the West. So that made for a, a really fun way to close out my career. Um, well, the, let's start a little bit with this uh, very old history. Um, the BLM is what remains of the original public domain land that the, the U.S. acquired. Much of it was ill-gotten through various treaters, treaties. We talked about Native Americans uh, ancestral lands before, but but once that came into federal ownership, about 75% of the country was public domain land uh, initially, and that land was uh, carved up for various uh, national parks, military reservations, much of it was homesteaded, uh, some of it was withdrawn as the national force, so uh, once we got into the World War II era, there was an interest in retaining what remained of the public domain under long-term stewardship. And that's how the BLM came into being. We uh, didn't uh, exist before 1946. That was the general land office uh, before that. Um, and I shouldn't say we, I should say they, because I am now retired, but, but anyway, um, then in 1976 is when the BLM first got its uh, long-term mission, a multiple-use mission. So uh, the King Range actually predates the BLM having a, uh, an organic act, as they call it. And the BLM is very much a workhorse agency. Um, it's, it's also a chameleon agency in, in that depending on where you are, um, the public lands are managed very differently. If you go down to the California desert, there's a lot of renewable energy projects, also a lot of cool wilderness areas down there. Um, in Nevada, there's major uh, mineral projects going on. The upper right here is a lithium mine evaporative pond area in uh, Silver City, Nevada. Lots of uh, different recreation opportunities going on on the public lands. Of course, grazing historically has been a, um, a major use of the public lands. So lots of different uses, and including development of, uh, of public lands for uh, various commodities for, um, for the American people. And um, so the lands are zoned pretty much through a land use planning program. Uh, for these various uses. And uh, because the Arcata office and Northern California offices in general don't have a lot of, of BLM public land, if you go over to Nevada, gosh, I think 80% of the state is uh, BLM managed land, but it's it's so much different in, in Arcata where the remnants of public lands are mostly set aside as conservation lands and old growth reserves and uh, other uh, types of protected units because there's, uh, you know, forestry and other activities going on on private lands, so they they balance that out. So, um, oops, let me see, go to the next slide. So the King Range history actually goes um, back to 1929, and this this is a bad map. I apologize. This map is. Interestingly, a counter proposal to the original Redwood National Park um, uh, 
proposal, the you know park that was designated up in Oric, they were looking at another option that would link Humboldt Redwood State Park to the remaining public lands in, in the King Range. And we actually ended up doing some of that with the Redwoods to Sea project during my tenure and later at the King Range. Those of you that are familiar with Gillum Butte um, in between Humboldt Redwoods and the King Range. But if you look over along the coastline, you'll notice that there, the gray lands along the coast are what the original public domain lands were when the King Range was withdrawn from further dispossession, as they called it then, for more homesteading or more transfer to timber companies or private landowners. There's about 37,000 acres of land back then, and the state of California actually petitioned uh, the department or the general land office to withdraw it, but it wasn't known what would be done with it, just that the state wanted to uh, have some of the public lands along the coastline conserved. So the history actually goes pretty far back um, with the, uh, the King Range. And the area didn't get its uh, uh, National Conservation Area designation until 1970, uh, but that was a pretty long process that started back in the early 60s. Clem Miller was the congressman that championed the King Range designation, and when he passed away in 1962, Don Clausen carried it through the finish line um, and also was involved with getting Redwood National Park designated, um, Golden Gate National Recreation Area, um, and uh, see what a uh, point raise was the other one. So interestingly, um, Congressman Clausen was a, a Republican and a, a staunch conservation minded person um, and uh, really pushed for, for these proposals to go through. And uh, another little aside here, this is Abalone Point on the King Range. And those of you that uh, wonder why there's all those little coastal parcels, um, not just Malcolm's Park and Abalone Point, but other parcels along the coastline, the county um, coastal management program and plan wasn't um, signed off by the Coastal Commission for the southern third of Humboldt County because Shelter Cove didn't have any um, public access to the coastline. So they were basically dead in the water for further development of the Shelter Cove subdivision until uh, public access was purchased. So um, some funding was allocated and those, those parcels were uh, picked up so that the development could continue in the cove. Um, but the King Range, again, even though it was designated in uh, 19, well, it was actually identified for designation in 1970. And I just kind of learned this myself. It was not truly designated until 1974 when uh, basically Congress said the BLM is to develop a management plan. And upon presenting that through the secretary to the president, it would be designated as an NCA so that uh, the original act was 70, but the, uh, des the, the land use plan was completed in 1974. And the land use plan was much different than the, the management we're working under today. It had eight different management zones, uh, mostly for conservation and protection, but on the Eastern side of the King Range, there uh, were areas that were uh, proposed for timber production and management. Those areas um, evolved over the years with the Northwest Forest Plan passage and the listing of the spotted owl so that they all became old growth reserves. And there were never any timber cuts in the King Range except for a few small salvage uh, harvest operations back in the, the early tenure of the, the area after some, some fires there. Um, both the north and south end of the King Range and even the central part near the uh, Smith and Etter cabin were accessible to motor vehicles early in the tenure of, of the King Range. Um, at first, the, uh, the north end was closed up by the Matole River, primarily because there was a, a lot of impact from vehicle use on the cultural resources up there and the midden sites and such. And then as use started to increase and there was more interest in wilderness uh, during my tenure, it's one of two hard Hardest, two of the most difficult projects I worked on in my career was when we closed uh, Black Sands Beach to uh, 
to vehicle use. There was a three and a half miles um, down at the south end. So, um, you know, you look at the King Range of today and think, wow, it's all, you know, wilderness and uh, uh, lots of backcountry uh, protected areas. But, but initially it was a much more open area for, for a lot of different uses. Um, I did dig up a couple of slides. I didn't take these, but this, these two bottom slides are the elk reintroduction and the King Range where they pulled uh, elk down from Prairie Creek State Park and uh, put them out in um, Hidden Valley. And most of the elk have since migrated south into the Cynthion, but they spend time between uh, Hidden Valley and Cynthion. So it was quite an operation to, to get the elk transplanted down there. Okay. So a couple of people that had a big role in both the King Range and the National Conservation Lands. So you may recognize a few of these folks. The, the first person on the left is Linda Roush, the longtime field manager of the King Range, sitting next to her is Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt. Uh, and then Gary Pritchard Peterson with the hat uh, was the manager of the King Range for a long time. And then Ed Hasty, who was uh, a longtime state director of BLM California and actually predates Splitma. He actually was an engineer uh, that led the construction of the King Range Road, had a lot of history with the, the King Range. Uh, and then our director, Pat Shea, is right next to him. But Ed, Ed Hasty developed a good rapport with Bruce Babbitt and was not afraid to express his opinions, had a lot of pride in the BLM. And when the California Desert Protection Act was being passed, a large portion of uh, BLM land in the California desert was being transferred over to the National Park Service as the uh, Mojave National Preserve expansion of Death Valley National Monument and New Park and Joshua Tree into a park. And uh, Mr. Hasty said to Bruce Babbitt, you know, some of those lands are core to BLM's conservation mission. Why are are you guys supporting transfer uh, to another agency, i.e. the Park Service, if you expect BLM to embrace its conservation component of its mission, um, somebody, you know, we need to quit plucking the crown jewels from the agency, so to speak, and transferring them to other agencies. So Bruce Babbitt actually took that to heart, and it was too late for the California desert but then uh, when it came time for designating what's now the largest national monument in uh, the lower 48, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, well, it was the largest and then President Trump reduced it and now it's the largest again, but it was designated in, in the mid nineties and everyone thought that it was gonna be transferred to the park service, but the uh, uh, President Clinton uh, retain the uh, management on, under BLM's uh, jurisdiction and basically said, um, Bruce Babbitt said to, to the BLM director, you know, now's your chance to shine. You, you're going to make or break your conservation mission, depending on how you, you manage this area and others. And after the uh, Grand Staircase was designated, and I'll talk more about national monuments in a few minutes, um, a number, a large number of additional national monuments were identified and they retain, were retained under BLM management or in some cases, U.S. Forest Service management. So it sort of stopped the transfer of monuments over to the, uh, the National Park Service. And I think right now the BLM actually might have more acreage in national monuments, maybe not more number than the National Park Service. Um, so this is what the system looks like now, the National Conservation Lands Program. And I'll go through each of the various designations and give you a little bit of background on how they're different, how they're similar, and how they complement one another. But there's about uh, almost 900 units across the, uh, the Western states in Alaska. Um, and uh, a large chunk of the units are here in California and some, some really amazing areas. So the, the national conservation lands are just a term that the BLM has come up with for this total family of designations that includes national conservation areas like the, uh, the King Range, but also national monuments, wilderness areas, wild and scenic rivers, national scenic trails, and, and other designations. And 
you know, for the general public, you might think, well, you know, there's an agency pride thing in the BLM or the Forest Service or another agency retaining management of uh, lands um, versus transferring them over to another agency. But the, the one thing that I like to remind people of uh, with, with BLM managed national monuments and, and national conservation areas, as opposed to national park units, is they're much less developed. They're the BLM's management philosophy is to let people discover these areas on their own, um, very primitive facilities, limited facilities, and they're generally much less crowded. So uh, this was uh, Arches National Park. This is about a 20 year old photo, but I thought I might have a half dozen more people photographing the full moon up at Delicate Arch with me on this given evening. And I ended up just photographing the the uh, audience versus versus the moon. There were so many folks there, but um, it's harder to find solitude on any public lands right now um, after COVID, especially. But in general, um, BLM national monuments, national conservation areas are, are less busy, less developed, and and you really need to be more prepared for creating your experience going out there. Not saying you can't get that in the national parks, but it's just in general. I think Colin Ewing might be on the the call, the new uh, field manager in um, in Arcata, and this is where Colin used to work. This is the largest concentration of arches outside Arches National Park in the Guinness Canyons National Conservation Area in Colorado. Again, you have to get uh, into a either beat up four wheel drive road, getting down to a a trailhead that's reasonably close to these, or you have to hike six or seven miles up a primitive trail to get to them. So when I've been there uh, three or four times, I've maybe run into you know a couple of other groups there, but you can really have an experience of solitude and discovery in, in a lot of these places that, that you can't get at least in the more developed parts of the national parks. So for the rest of the presentation, I'd like to mainly focus on the various designations of, of the national uh, conservation lands. And we'll start out with, with national monuments. National monuments are designated under the Antiquities Act that was originally passed in 1906. And it allowed for, it gave the president authority to set aside national monuments to protect certain uh, objects, uh, particularly uh, historic and, and Native American sites, as well as uh, natural features, and set them aside for protection as as national monuments. The importance of that is it give, gives the it's the only protective designation of this scale that the president can unilaterally designate. Um, he or she doesn't have to go to Congress to get approval. So that's caused a lot of um, uh, you know, feathers to get ruffled in Congress. They want to rein in the president to uh, not allow for this level of authority, but it's been used from the first, uh, you know, since the act was passed, Teddy Roosevelt um, designated the Grand Canyon as one of the early national monuments, and it was a huge area, and it's, it's now obviously one of our crown jewel national parks. But um, the national monuments are just over includes some of the most amazing resources um, that I've ever visited. And the cool thing is, again, um, you know, this is Bears Ears National Monument in southeast Utah. These are ancient Pueblo um, sites. And the cool thing is you can explore these areas and you're not fenced off and on a paved, you know, trail going around them. You can actually get out and uh, visit them in a wilderness type setting, an undeveloped setting. This is a, a big man panel in, in Grand Gulf. It's actually, the, these figures are taller than I am. Just, again, just getting that feeling of discovery, undeveloped nature. Um, so, so the monuments are set aside both for natural and, and cultural resource values. Uh, this is the Carrizo Plain and scientific values, the Carrizo Plain National Monument, which is has some brilliant wildflowers whenever they get uh, moisture, enough moisture down there every every few years. But this is um, uh, an area called Wallace Creek, which is one of the most studied areas along the San Andreas Fault. 
uh, in the Creasel Plain. And you can see that uh, drainage coming down uh, from the foot slopes of what's called the Tembler Range, and then it hits that line and turns sharply to the left. So that's the San Andreas, and then it goes back down uh, the rest of the slope. So that's basically showing the the offset of the San Andreas uh, from various earthquakes. So several hundred feet of offset, uh, and it's been studied by you know top uh, seismic scientists and. Uh, geologists all over the world because it's such a textbook example. So another example of, of a cool scientific object in a monument. Um, this is the California Coastal National Monument. There's a few of the um, uh, rocks and islands that make up the coastal monument uh, here in the King Range. Uh, this shot's up by Crescent City and uh, you know, again, these are le what were leftover lands. Nobody settled the rocks and islands off the California coast. They were, were considered worthless, you know, as far as homesteading or, or most other uses. So they remained in the public domain. But of course, now we know these are some of the most critical habitat uh, in the state, uh, especially along such a highly developed coastline as we have further south in the state for refugia and nesting and roosting sites for seabirds and, and marine mammals. It's, it's pretty amazing. They're just pretty much wildlife hotels. Now we'll move on to, to national conservation areas. Oh, and I should mention all of the designations except national conservation areas have what's called an organic act. Like all national monuments, management of those monuments has to tie into the overarching principles of the Antiquities Act. Um, and all the other designations are tied to a base act, but national conservation areas and similar designations are standalone designations. So the King Range Act um, isn't tied to any other uh, uh, overall legislation. And, and it's a pretty broad act. If you read the act, it's, uh, it doesn't identify a lot of clear goals for protection. It gives a lot of, of um, uh, credence to, to the management plan. And that plan has evolved over the years with an update in the 2000s to, to go for a more protective designation or management of the area just because it's such a rare uh, gem of undeveloped land along the coast. Um, another example, this is just, this is a shot, I think this is from up on Saddle Mountain. You can see Shelter Cove and the foreground down there. But one of the resources that I am so happy that it's finally getting attention in the last 10 years is, is the night sky resource. And the uh, King Range is, is a pretty unique spot as far as night sky viewing in that the way the coast goes um, from, from southeast to northwest, when you're looking south at the Milky Way, you're looking offshore. And when you get up on the higher peaks like King Peak or Queen Peak or up on Saddle Mountain, you're up above the marine layer. So you're in that really dry air layer where you can just get amazing uh, views of the Milky Way. And there's absolutely no light pollution once you get out, out over the ocean. So great night sky viewing there. Um, for those of you that um, are camera buffs, um, you know, digital photography has made uh, photographing the Milky Way a lot of fun. And the camera, never sees what your eye sees. And in the case of uh, night sky photography, cameras pick up just a lot more light than your eyes are able to pick up. That's why you're able to see the, the milk of the Milky Way, so to speak, a lot more than you can see with your naked eye. So one of the national conservation areas that is managed almost like a national park unit, as a matter of fact, if it were a national park, it would be 15th and visitation among the national park units is the um, uh, Red Rocks National Conservation Area in uh, Las Vegas, just uh, west of Las Vegas. And some of you that have been to Vegas, I'm sure have seen the Red Cliffs rising 3,000 feet above the, the plain there in the Red Rocks. The view from um, up above Red Rocks down in the lower uh, left of this photo is actually looking out over the Las Vegas Strip. So you can see how how close it actually is to Las Vegas. Um, so Red Rocks does have a big visitor center, a paved loop tour, but you can still, and, and as you can in many national park wilderness areas, series, once you get off that um, uh, developed loop and uh, 
uh, development area, you can have the place to yourself. I was up in what's called the Rainbow Mountain Wilderness, uh, which is within Red Rocks uh, for three days, looking out over the strip of Vegas. Never saw another person the whole time I was up there. Pretty incredible. Um, so another uh, national conservation area that's pretty close to you guys. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Black Rock uh, Desert High Rock Canyon Immigrant Trails, NCA in Nevada. And this area protects um, a huge swath of desert landscape that, that uh, the, the California and Applegate Trails traverse through uh, during the, the great immigration westward. And the Black Rock itself is in the middle of the playa that you're looking at there, the, the, the darker colored rock. Um, there's still uh, carvings in the uh, some of the canyon walls as you go along some of the old two-track routes through the, the Black Rock, um, showing some of the immigrants like to carve their initials to, uh, to show that they made it through there. Um, this was one of the worst parts of, of the, the Westwood migration on the California Trail. There's a couple hot springs right by Black Rock itself, and the oxen were so thirsty when they got near those hot springs that they would dive into the springs and they were near boiling temperatures. So obviously the oxen didn't fare too well, but it uh, it was pretty pretty amazing uh, landscape. And it's there aren't a lot of places where you can immerse yourself in a totally natural landscape, uh, looking landscape, appearing landscape of this scale in the West, especially in the desert West where you're looking uh, for a hundred miles. So pretty special place. Um, so the legislation that designated the Black Rock, um, Burning Man, most of you are familiar with the Burning Man event, uh, 80,000 people a year gather on the Palaya at the Black Rock each year. And Burning Man actually predated the designation of the, uh, the NCA. So some folks feel, well, it's not really appropriate to have uh, an event like Burning Man within the National Conservation Area. Now you can argue size-wise and should it grow, things like that, but it's actually written in the legislation that the BLM will allow uh, large events to occur, to continue to occur on the, the prior. So Congress specifically, uh, Harry Reid specifically had that written into the act so that, uh, that those events could continue. Uh, curiously, the Palaya and the Black Rock Deserts also the home of the world land speed record. That's that car on the lower right. It's also the only car that has broken, uh, has had a sonic boom by breaking the, the sound barrier. So there's some pretty amazing stuff that goes on out on, on that Palaya. And it's it's a juggling process for BLM to, to try to allow for some of these uses while still protecting the, the resources that make the area significant. Um, another example of a unique designation that's a standalone designation is the Headwaters Forest Reserve. Ed Hasty again was the state director was really behind uh, getting this uh, uh, last private uh, area of, of Redwood, Old Growth Redwoods transferred to the BLM. There was a lot of discussion whether it should be a wildlife refuge or the Forest Service should manage it or it should be a uh, added to Redwood uh, National Park, but uh, it, it came under BLM stewardship. And, and the Headwater Forest Reserve Act also is unique in some ways in that it gives priority to wildlife and old growth dependent species habitat and management. So recreation is very much a, a secondary use and most of the areas close to recreation use other than a few uh, trails along the edges of the area so that it can be a, an intact ecosystem for old growth dependent species. Um, last but not least, uh, another unique designation, the Alabama Hills National Scenic Area just designated a few years ago. This is looking up at Mount Whitney, uh, the highest point in the lower 48, but the Alabama Hills has been used since the early 1900s as a major movie uh, filming location. The town of Lone Pine depends on revenue from filmmaking to um, uh, keep the community going. And they really were concerned uh, about having a national monument or some other type of designation that would possibly prohibit them from doing additional filming in the area. So they really worked hard with their congressional representatives and, and others to, to get a designation, a unique designation that would allow for that. Um, 
that continued filming. All right, so let's move on to a couple other designations. Um, this is uh, really a cool photo in that this is the penstock from the John uh, Boyle power plant uh, just below Klamath Falls in Oregon. And this is one of the dams that's slated for removal on the, the Klamath uh, River, which will hopefully come through. But during the big dam building era in the 50, 40s, 50s, and 60s, there was a really concerted effort by conservationists uh, that, that hey, we're damming all these rivers, let's retain some rivers in their free flowing natural state or some river segments, not, not often full rivers, um, so that they aren't dammed and they aren't developed and, and they're allowed to run free. So that culminated with the passage of the, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in 1968. And um, the Eel River is actually designated under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act under a special provision of the act and that normally it takes Congress, uh, an act of Congress to designate um, uh, a wild and scenic river, but there is a provision of the act that the governor can petition the Secretary of Interior to uh, designate a river segment. And um, Jerry Brown during his first administration back in the early eighties, I think it was 1981, had a bunch of rivers uh, petition the secretary to designate rivers in California that had dams proposed on them, including the Round Valley Dam on the Eel River. So the Eel is one of the largest or longest wild and scenic river stretches in the country. Um, the difference with the state governor designation versus the uh, congressional designation is the state itself is supposed to take the lead on managing the river, at least as it goes through private lands and state lands along the river. And Unfortunately, California really hasn't stepped up in this regard. Um, curiously, Caltrans is the agency that pays the most attention to wild and scenic rivers in California because they have to be careful if they're proposing bridges or any type of riprap or development along river segments that they don't um, interfere with the free flowing nature of the river. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, cool river segments here in California, including the eel. And um, the first eight wild and scenic rivers actually, interestingly enough, predate the King Range as the first conservation designations that the BLM managed. Two of the original eight wild and scenic rivers in 1968 were BLM managed rivers, and that includes the Rio Grande River here in New Mexico, and just north of you guys, the Rogue River in Oregon was one of the first uh, eight rivers. And as a, a prelude to um, Instagram influencer, Zane Gray's cabin is on the upper right uh, of this photo. It's actually on, uh, was acquired by the BLM. So it um, has been restored uh, and it's open for public access. But Zane Gray wrote a lot of Western novels, as many of you know, I think Riders in Purple Haze. I, I haven't read a lot of his, or any of his stuff. Um, it's, uh, but anyway, he wrote a lot of books on the Rogue, and they started building so much interest in fishing on the Rogue River that it became too crowded for Zane. Uh, so he moved up on to the Umpqua River, um, and he was upset that, that the Rogue had gotten too crowded, even though he was the one that, that was responsible for it. Um, and obviously, wild and scenic rivers aren't just pretty areas to boat. Um, they contain some... Uh, usually significant natural resource values here on the North Coast, uh, salmon and steelhead species, uh, long-term traditional use by native tribes. The Klamath still has some uh, fish, uh, fishing platforms like this, I believe. This particular one uh, for salmon fishing is up, up on the Deschutes in Oregon. So very important culturally, um, you know, rivers are the lifeblood of America and, and the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act is just a way to protect some of them uh, for, in this case, wildlife and the, the upper Missouri. Um, and we always think of wild and scenic rivers or rivers in general as big uh, flowing rivers like the, the Eel or the Matil, but uh, some of the wild and scenic rivers are pretty unique, especially in desert areas. This is the Amargosa which is actually flows uh, underground most of its length, but is uh, flows on the surface in some areas near Shoshone. Uh, 
uh, in other areas uh, east of Death Valley. The water in the Amargosa is saltier than the ocean. Um, it hosts uh, what's probably the rarest mammal, uh, endangered mammal and endangered species list, the Amargosa vole. So just a really unique uh, desert river, uh, just as important as any whitewater river, uh, just different. Um, the, so the National Scenic and Historic Trails Act was passed on the same day by President Johnson as the um, uh, Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And initially it focused on National Scenic Trails, which are the long distance trails uh, that uh, uh, cross states along the, uh, the Pacific Crest Trail, the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail. Others have been added since then. Um, but later, the National Scenic Trails Act was expanded to include historic trail corridors that were important to certain components of U.S. history. Um, and the closest national trail that, uh, that you guys have would be the Pacific Crest Trail. The California Trail, of course, got Im immigrants over into to this area, but the trail ended because they arrived here. But there's routes like the Pony Express, um, uh, various, the Trail of Tears, various Native American historic uh, uh, routes. Um, and uh, you, know, you can see they're pretty much interspersed uh, throughout the country. And we often think of the National Scenic Trails as, you know, the Reese, Witherspoon, the hiking, uh, doing through hiking on the national trails. Um, and they do get a lot of backpacking use, but I like to remind people that the national scenic trails also get a lot of day use, especially where they're close to towns like the Pacific Crest Trail and Palm Springs. And they have an allure to them that uh, uh, they serve as, as ways to attract visitors to, to try hiking in, in some of these areas. They're, they're basically the rock stars of the trail system. Um, the BLM manages the Iditarod Trail up in Alaska, which was historically used as a um, access to gold fields up in, in parts of interior Alaska, but became famous with the, the dog sled uh, mush to get the diphtheria drug to, to Nome. So uh, the BLM maintains some trail cabins along the route. I was able to get up there uh, a couple of years ago to photograph it. And I actually had all my gear underneath um, one of the areas where about six or seven mushers were sapped out on the floor and I was afraid to disturb any. And I wanted to get it, I'd probably get in trouble or mess up the race or something, but it was really cool to spend time with, with these mushers. Um, this is the Lewis and Clark Trail over Lemhi Pass, which is where Lewis and Clark, with the help of her leadership of Sacagawea, made it over the Continental Divide. This is near uh, Salmon, Idaho. Again, um, you know, this big expanse of landscape uh, really gives you a feeling of what it must have looked like to the, uh, the original explorers. And sadly, this is the, the Nez Perce Trail north of the um, Upper Missouri River, which Lewis and Clark went through in their voyage of discovery in the early 1800s. And just 70 years later, uh, the Nez Perce went up this creek corridor after they crossed the river, uh, having been chased by the cavalry uh, through, oh, well over a thousand miles. And the tribe was, uh, captured just north of here before they were able to get across the border into Canada. So pretty amazing juxtapositioning of the, you know, discovery, so to speak, and exploration of the West by uh, Euro-Americans and how quickly that turned into despair and destruction of, of the Native Americans. And uh, wilderness, let's talk about wilderness. The King Range has a wilderness area within it. And it's and some folks always ask, why do we have all these overlapping designations? And if you look at, again, the organic app uh, for the wilderness system, it was passed uh, in 1964. And there was a long effort to get wilderness areas designated. Um, in addition to protecting areas as national parks, et cetera, uh, 
because there is a feeling that there should be some areas that are left in their primeval state that aren't developed at all, that you have to go in on foot or horseback. You know, you're not going to take vehicles or mountain bikes. There's not going to be any lodges or campgrounds there. They're going to, going to remain totally undeveloped. So the Wilderness Act, the, the primary directive under the Organic Act is to uh, protect solitude, protect the, the wilderness characteristics of the area, and to provide for that primitive um, recreation experience. And that's one reason uh, the BLM has uh, limited use in certain popular wilderness areas, including the Camarange. I, interestingly, the first summer I worked with the King Range, I was out on Big Flat over Fourth of July weekend, didn't see one person on Big Flat the whole holiday weekend. Uh, by the time I left Arcata, we were in the midst of developing an allocation plan just because use had gotten so high that um, you know we wouldn't be able to protect that wilderness resource, natural resource, or the wilderness experience of any type of solitude if, if we just let the area get overrun. This is another popular area called the Wave in Korea Canyon Vermilion Cliffs Wilderness Area, which is probably the most coveted photo spot in the US, um, one of the most coveted spots in the world. And the BLM does a lottery to uh, uh, allow a limited number of people to access this site every year. If, if it were open access, um, you probably wouldn't be able to see any of the rock there. It's just so, so many people want to go there. It's, it's, uh, but it's, it's protected as wilderness. So it's pretty cool. Um, obviously you guys deal with this in the King range with wilderness. Uh, you're taking nature on its own terms and each different part of the country and each, uh, different ecosystem has various natural hazards that, that you have to deal with. On the North Coast, of course, you have the large uh, ocean swells. This is uh, a slick rock or slot canyon area in Utah. Each year, uh, people drown in flash floods along uh, some of the slot canyons in, in Utah and Arizona. This one's in Muddy Creek Wilderness. Uh, and you can see this, the stain on the rock above my head in the upper left photo. Um, if you look down in the lower right photo, you can see how the rock gets lighter, probably about 30 or 40 feet up the canyon wall. That's how deep the water was running through there uh, four or five days before I was there. So these flash floods are just, you know, avalanches, flash floods, uh, ocean swells, uh, uh, education to let folks know how to prepare to visit these special areas is so important. And it's so awesome that, that you guys are playing such a big role in that. Um, especially, I was really enthused to hear that you have uh, trailhead uh, stations during holidays at, at the trailheads. That's really cool. Okay, I'm just going to rush through a couple of these last uh, ones. So you guys do have a um, an eclipse. It's a call. What do they call it? It's not a full eclipse, but it's going to hit up in Oregon next summer. So you to go up there. Uh, last but not least, we have wilderness study areas. The, the King Range uh, Wilderness Study Area was designated under the North Coast Bill. Uh, gosh, I forget what year that was. Um, uh, but uh, there's still about 400 or more wilderness study areas that the BLM studied for potential wilderness designation <coughs> once uh, FLIPMA was passed, our Organic Act, that, that required us to study potential wilderness areas and then to recommend their designation to Congress or not designation. And Congress, unfortunately, has been uh, sitting on some of these areas for pushing 40 years now. They haven't taken the ball and run with it. So a lot of them are still in limbo, um, including some incredible areas, Handy's Peak in Colorado. These are just some kind of photography uh, angles. This is uh, Slinkard in California. I encourage those of you that are into photography for night skies to go use the moon like the sun and get some cool full moon photos. This is moon on the aspen. Um, so I'll just skip through these. Bobcat draw in Wyoming. Um, some of the WSAs have become national monuments, again, just because the president has authority to designate national monuments. He's provided uh, 
protection for some of the units um, when Congress doesn't move on them. So for instance, the Grand Staircase, Bears Ears National Monuments have a number of wilderness study areas in them. This is an area that's being looked at now, being championed by some conservation groups in uh, Colorado, the um, Dolores River Canyons, which is partly in a wilderness study area. So it'll be interesting to see if President Biden um, moves forward. He's designated Camp Hale, a World War II camp, um, as a, a monument in Colorado, a Forest Service monument. But it'll be interesting to see if he moves on any other areas. Um, I'm just going to pop through this. This is actually the largest uh, block of federal land in the U.S. This is the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska, or uh, Western Arctic, which is almost the size of Indiana. It's like 23 million acres and just an incredibly vast area. Amazing natural resources. There's a, a big push by the conservation community to provide permanent protection for this area. And this is uh, some of the native Alaskans um, putting seal skins on a whaling boat up, up on the North shore. Um, pretty amazing how important that resource is for subsistence. And this is just the Arctic Ocean shoreline, unfortunately showing some effects of climate change with coastal erosion and permafrost melting. Um, so yeah, I think that is it. I know I went a little bit long. Um, that's comment Neo wise. So if you wanna um, flip back, I guess, oh, I have to stop screen sharing. Okay, I stop sharing. All right, thank you, Bob. That was a great talk and uh, lots of interesting information, uh, beautiful photos and just so fascinating to see the diversity uh, that the national conservation lands cover. I wasn't aware that the wild and scenic rivers were considered part of the National Conservation Land System. So, um, yeah, so that was really interesting to learn about. Um, we'd like to uh, offer people the opportunity now to uh, turn their cameras off and to ask questions. Um, so I am going to uh, make some changes here that allow people to do that. You could also seed questions into the chat and we can ask them that way. Um, but the other thing that, see, in the meantime, I guess I'd like to ask you, Bob, um, being that you visited so many of these places, I'm wondering if you have any favorite landscapes, either BLM or unprotected areas that you would really like to see um, receive higher level of uh, conservation protections. Well, of course, the King Range always comes up. Um, I, You know, it's hard to pick a favorite because every area of uh, the country and most of the BLM conservation lands are in, in the West, but they're all so unique. I love the Red Rock Canyon country of, of Utah, the North Slope of Alaska. I wouldn't even necessarily call it the most scenic, you know, uh, landscape, but just the, the vastness. You just feel so tiny being out on that landscape, knowing that you're 300 miles from the nearest road uh, when you're out there. Whoops, hold on. Oh, I had this on. And then another, another question I had is about um, local wilderness study areas. I know early on you mentioned something about Gillum Butte, and I know that it has certain characteristics that are considered wilderness values. And uh, so I just wondered if there are, um, you know, parcels within the Northern California um, landscape, uh, BLM lands that, uh, you know, are, you know, maybe appropriate for, you um, you know, wilderness designation, or at least uh, at some stage of consideration for that mm -hmm. protection. Yeah, there, there's actually been a lot of litigation about that, starting back with the Bruce Babbitt <laughs> administration, where um, some folks argue that that inventory was a one-time thing required by FLIPMA, but then the courts have agreed that the BLM needs to continue to update it's inventory of areas that that may meet the the requirements of the Wilderness Act. Or the the Wilderness Act has a a bunch of criteria in it that an area has to meet. It has to be roadless. It has to be generally larger than five thousand acres. Um, and and there's some other uh, has to be apparently natural. And there are areas in you know Northwest California headwaters for for example. We inventoried 
uh, the old growth and headwaters, and it's definitely has, you know, wilderness character. There's other areas that for us to inventory, and we have to use the criteria Congress gave us, and they may not meet those criteria, so we don't recommend them, or the BLM doesn't recommend that they be managed for wilderness characteristics, but then Congress can do whatever they want if they want to designate them. So there's situations where conservation organizations say, yeah, it might not meet those criteria perfectly, but we still feel it should be wilderness. So, so there's two sides of it, I guess, the agency side that they have to follow the law, but then there's the congressional side. If, if they want to protect an area, they can, they can move forward. So I don't know if that confused you, but that's no, um, and, and typically you say that there's a number of places that have been wilderness study areas for decades. And so is that uh, common that people, that they stay in this limbo situation? Yeah, and uh, it depends on the state. Like in the California desert, that huge bill back in the early 90s, there's only like three or four areas left, wilderness study areas in the desert. In um, uh, Northern California, there's only little isolated wilderness study areas left because of the North Coast Bill. And those of you that know Ryan Henson, he was a champion of that. If you go over um, up into Oregon or over into Colorado, there's dozens of areas that have been sitting in limbo for, you know, since the studies were completed in 1991. So it's just when an area is ripe politically for moving forward with, um, you know, just like Clem Miller and Don Clausen, it took 20 years to get the King Range designated, 20 plus years. Um, it takes a long time for these bills to, to, to hit the right level of support to get designated. And, and again, that's one reason the, the president uses the Antiquities Act to at least get some protections through national monuments. They're not, it's a very different the level of protection than, than wilderness, but still major protection. And, and with the wilderness study areas, are those, um, do the, is that some level of protection or is it purely a study area? Um, no, they have to be, they, most agencies, except for the BLM, manage wilderness study areas as if they were wilderness, but the BLM allows some levels of use, like you can drive on two track roads, but which you don't see as much in California, but in you know Utah and Nevada, you have all these in the desert. You have all these two track routes that weren't roads by definition under FLIPMA, but they're still accessible to vehicles. So those have remained open. Um, there are some mining allowances for um, staking mining claims in wilderness study areas. You can't necessarily develop them um, unless until the area is decided on, but. But yeah, so there, but there is a high level of protection for them. Um, Great. One last question I have, but and please, everybody, uh, chime in after this if you have questions or see them in the chat. Um, but uh, areas of areas of critical environmental concern (ACEC) so that is a designation within BLM properties that signifies that those properties are of some high ecological value. Um, I don't yeah, that's that another, that's written right into the Federal Land Policy and Management Act or FLIPMA, which is BLM's Organic Act, that the agency will identify areas that, that have what are called relevant and important values. And the, the values need to be greater than locally significant. They can um, be ecological. They can, um, you know, be cultural. There, there's various values that they can have, but it is an administrative designation and those designations can get changed with an amendment of a management plan, um, which is one reason there's a push for these congressional and presidential designations because they, they do offer more permanence. So, but that said, areas of critical environmental concern are, are very important tools and there's, there's a lot of them in the Arcata field office. So. Yeah, so I was going to say, I was looking at the Climate Atlas tool, which is a great um, resource for folks who haven't checked that out. They can Google Climate Atlas tool, but it uh, shows conservation um, uh, value of, of properties throughout the country and, and North Coast. And I was impressed by you know how many um, smaller holdings there were that were BLM properties that were listed as areas of critical environmental concern. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, other folks out there, anybody else on this call interested to uh, ask a question, please, uh, you know, turn your camera on or uh, turn your mic on and uh, ask away if so, or uh, put it in the chat. And if, uh, if we don't have any questions, then uh, I'd like to uh, thank Bob for, for joining us tonight. It looks like uh, we're lacking on additional questions. Anything else uh, you want to say? Well, here's someone who's trying to call it. You got some question you'd like to ask? Well, yeah, was, thanks, Bob, for being here. And um, I kind of wanted to introduce myself. I'm Colin Ewing. I'm the new field manager for the BLM out of Arcata. Um, so really thank Friends of the Lost Coast for putting this on and doing all the work that you guys do to, to steward the public lands out there at the Lost Coast and the King Range. Um, so yeah, Bob, what, what advice would you have for a new field manager coming in to manage public lands in Humboldt County? Get to know the community. <laughs> like everywhere in BLM, it's an amazing community and um, I mean, I'm sure you're learning what's happened in the Matoll watershed since the, what, 70s as far as restoration work and community stewardship. And I mean, it's just pretty amazing what goes on on the North Coast. So um, got, got some great folks there and I'm really glad I uh, got to know Colin when he was in Colorado and just really excited that, that you're on board. and. Um, and get out, get out hiking too. <laughs> and surfing, of course. <laughs> All right, thank you, Colin. And uh, yeah, looks like you're getting some thanks in the chat. So uh, barring any other questions, last chance, anybody want to chime in and ask a question before we uh, wrap this up? Seeing none, uh, I would like to on behalf of Friends of the Lost Coast and BLM King Range National Conservation Area, many thanks to Bob Wick and the Bureau of Land Management for this lecture. We hope you found it educational and inspiring. Visit lostcoast.org or our YouTube channel for a recording of the lecture, which will be posted in the coming days. And don't forget to join us next Wednesday, November 9th, from 6 to 7 p.m. for part two of our Conserved Lands and Waters of the Lost Coast Lecture Series. It'll feature Kala Allison, Executive Director of NPA Collective, and her talk on marine protected areas conserving the waters of the iconic Lost Coast. And our final lecture of this three-part series is on tribal protected areas of the Lost Coast, and it will be on Thursday, November 17th from 6 to 7 p.m., and will feature Priscilla Hunter and Hawk Rosales of the Intertribal Sinkio and Wilderness Council. So thanks again for tuning in tonight, and uh, to learn more about Friends of the Lost Coast or to make a donation to support our work, including programs like this lecture series, uh, please visit our website at lostcoast.org. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and now TikTok. Enjoy the rest of your evening and all the best from friends of the Lost Coast. And thanks again to Bob Wick. Good night, everybody. Thanks, you guys. Good night. <laughs>